Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Boosting Climate Confidence Throughout the Newsroom. I'm Mark Hertzgard. I'm the Executive Director of Covering Climate Now and the Environment Correspondent at The Nation Magazine. For those of you who don't know, Covering Climate Now is a journalistic consortium with more than 400 news outlets around the world, reaching a combined audience of roughly 2 billion people. And we are very proud today to be co-hosting this event along with our esteemed partners at Climate Matters in the Newsroom and also Southerly Magazine. To introduce, so climate change is the defining story of our time. You wouldn't know that from what our colleagues in the White House press corps just did in their first press conference with President Biden, not one question on climate change. Nevertheless, as global temperatures are rising and causing more destructive weather, and with a climate realist in the White House, we, we believe that covering the climate story is no longer optional, it is imperative. And today we're gonna try and bring everybody uh, up to speed on how to do that, even if you're relatively new to the climate story. We have a stellar group of panelists who's gonna, who are gonna be joining us from across the Southern region, and I will introduce uh, them in just a moment. But uh, first, let me just say what we're gonna be talking about, uh, the challenges that they have faced as they've reported climate in their newsrooms, and also tips for all of us on how we can do a better job with this, especially telling stories in a way that centers human beings and are relatable for our audiences. We'll talk about best practices, mistakes to avoid, and of course, lots of time for questions and answers. And we're going to concentrate on the kinds of issues that uh, climate change really raises across the South. Of course, hurricanes, downpours, flooding, extreme heat, uh, environmental racism, and uh, health impacts, and so much more. So let me just say that as we go forward, you're invited to tweet uh, during the conversation. You can also converse with one another. I'm sure you're all up to speed on this now. Look at the chat button at the bottom of your screen. You can chat with uh, fellow attendees. You can send messages to the panelists. Um, and you'll find the Twitter handles at the bottom of that chat box as well. We've already received a lot of questions in the RSVPs. We'll get to as many of those as possible, but we also encourage you to ask questions during the session here. We will in fact pause two times during the 90 minutes we have today for Q&A uh, to make sure that we try to get to all of your questions. So uh, be prepared and don't give up if you're not, uh, your question isn't asked in the first presentation. We're gonna stop first after the first two presentations, which will be about audiences and what uh, our audiences want to know about climate change, and then also Climate Science 101. And throughout this, we will be sharing resources that you can use to improve your reporting. So let me now quickly introduce our uh, panelists. And um, let me start, hold on just a second here. Pardon me. Okay. So first, Dr. Lynn Carter. She is an adjunct faculty at uh, Louisiana State University, better known as LSU, and also the University of Arizona. She has authored or contributed to all four of the U.S. National Climate Assessment Reports, and she's the lead author for the Southeast chapter of the fourth assessment. That's the major statement of the U.S. government on climate change. Dr. Lynn Carter. Also joining us, Heather McTeer Tony. She's with Moms Clean Air Force, but she was also the youngest mayor ever elected to Greenville, Mississippi. And she served as a regional administrator in the US Environmental Protection Agency under President Obama. As I say, she's now with the NGO Moms Clean Air Force. Also joining us, Mark Schlefstein of the Times-Picayune and the New Orleans Advocate newspaper, where he has been for 37 years, a real dean in our field. He is a Pulitzer Prize winner, and he wrote my first introduction to his work actually uh, came after Hurricane Katrina because Mark Schlefstein and his colleague John McQuaid wrote a, an award-winning series called, let me get this, Washing Away, that basically predicted three years in advance what a storm like Hurricane Katrina would do. Nobody listened. Also, our co-sponsor, Lindsay Gilpin of Southerly Magazine. She's the founder and editor-in-chief at Southerly, and she's covered climate change and environmental justice issues across the United States, not just in the South, for outlets including Harper's, Vice, The Daily Beast, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Grist. Unfortunately, Vanessa Alonso, 
is not able to join us today precisely because of the extreme weather that is hitting her area. She is a meteorologist at WCBI TV that serves the uh, sort of north of Mississippi and Alabama region. We will hope to see her at another occasion. And then finally, last but not least, my dear and esteemed co-partner at uh, Climate Matters Now, who has been so instrumental to so much of our work at, at covering climate now, Bernadette Woods Plackey, longtime meteorologist on uh, TV, including back in Baltimore, where my own dad was in the TV business, and uh, now the chief meteorologist at Climate Central and Climate Matters in the newsroom. And she is co-moderating this event. And Bernadette, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Mark. And just before we get into it, everybody, I want to say if you are in an area that is being threatened by severe weather, we are recording this. We will have this afterwards. That we do know is the priority. So take care of yourself. First and foremost, we can always follow up with this. And those of us on here would be welcome to take your questions even after all of this. So to start out with, to get into the subject matter, one of the things we find most is that people are have this misconception of what the public really thinks about this subject matter of climate change. It's become so politicized and there's so much misinformation floating around that it's hard sometimes for people to navigate and figure out what's going on. So we're gonna start out with a couple of slides and just bear with me as I share my screen because I wanna give you a snapshot. Now, this is information that comes from Yale University and George Mason University. They do a survey twice a year really breaking down the American public on six different areas of climate change and where people are in their views, their opinions, their beliefs on this subject matter. Now, I personally try to stay away from the word belief with respect to climate change because it's a science, but this is how it all comes together. I wanna show you. Look all the way on the right there, that small bubble. That's less than 10% of our population. Now, that's the group that's really not open to a conversation about climate change, but they're the ones that are going to come at you really strong on social media. So if you are tailoring your conversation about climate change and you're reporting on climate change to that audience and avoiding it for that reason, you're missing 90% of the population who really is interested in learning more about this. In that middle section, doubtful, disengaged, cautious, they have questions but they're open to listening. These are the people that aren't going to engage with you necessarily on social media and tell you you're either great or awful or give you feedback on every story that you've done, but they are consuming that information and they want to learn more. Now on the left, alarmed, concerned, that's more than half the population. And the thing is, they really want to know more. They wanna know how this affects them personally and what they can do about it. So another way to look at this data, and this is really important because we're dealing with a lot of local news on here and local news, this is so critical to getting the message out and helping inform community because this is a global issue of climate change, but you feel it locally, you experience it locally, and you are part of your local community. And you see across the board here, when this data is downscaled, the public is still interested in learning. More than 70% across the board are convinced the climate is changing. Now you start to see those numbers drop off when we get into human causation, personal harm, but where you see those numbers go through the roof is renewable energy. It's an area that everyone's interested in. And you can dig into this data on your own. They have all these questions that they break down this topic of climate change on that they've asked the public. And then you can get down into your own individual community, whether it's by county or state or congressional district, all of that is available. Another thing here, even though this is the biggest issue of our time that is affecting everything that we love and that we support, people aren't talking about it enough in the news. 25% of people hear about climate change regularly in their media. But look at this, they want to hear about it. More than 74% of the population, and look, we are focusing on the South today. Look at this, there are a lot of yellows, oranges, and reds. People want to know more about how climate change is affecting them. What does it mean? They have questions. And that's where there's an opportunity to inform your audience about what's going on. And that's really the basis for this conversation today. So we do look at this as the beginning of a conversation for so many new people who are joining us today with all of our organizations. We're doing a lot of different things that we'll get into, but 
we want to continue this conversation as we go forward. And as we do that, we're going to start out with Dr. Lynn Carter. She's going to give us a real summary on the science. And then after that, we're going to go to Heather Tony, really diving into the intersectionality of this issue. And then we'll pause for the first Q&A. So Dr. Lynn, I'd love for you to take it away now. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. There we go. Okay. I'm going to, I've been asked to give you actually climate change, the short story here today. And hmm, okay, it doesn't want to move. Wait a minute. There we go. Essentially, the short story is it's real, it's us, it's harmful. Scientists agree, but there is hope. But before I move into the story, I want to talk about what is it? A lot of people are confused about what is a climate change. Climate change is a long-term change in global or regional climate patterns. By long-term, we mean at least decades, uh, could be to millions of years. It's, an average, it's a change in the average weather condition. For example, greater or fewer extreme events. And I'm gonna talk about lots of average weather conditions that are changed that we're using as indicators right now. It could be for just a region, it could be globally. Right now, we think of it as global in scope and since we began uh, burning fossil fuels. The second thing I wanna talk about the it. So climate change is the long-term trend. Climate variability is the yearly fluctuation. Climate still varies around that average, that average um, all the time, every year. It's a typically a long-term average, like the red line you see is, is long-term average and the variations are year to year. And climate change is not based on one drought or one prolonged dry season. It has to happen for some long time. So let's get back to the story now. It's real, climate change is happening. The future will be different than the past. Let's talk about this for a second. These are the observed changes that I mentioned as indicators. I'm just gonna go around the graphic here to show you what is already changing. So climate change is the long-term change in the average weather related, any, any weather related condition. So we've, we've seen many observed changes, the top left to the, to the top right, all the way around. We've seen uh, temperatures are increasing, heat waves are increasing, heavy precipitation is increasing, snowpack, we're losing that in the West. Drought is still an issue and getting larger. Arctic sea ice, we're losing that. US sea level is increasing. Marine species are moving. They're either moving north or deeper because they like the temperature that they like. Ocean acidity is increasing. There are changes in the growing season, plus and minus. There are wildfires that are increasing in size. We're having a, a need for more cooling degree days and fewer heating degree days. These are all already underway and we're experiencing them in different ways in different places. Let's look at one indicator over decades. This graphic shows the overall temperature. Each of the last five decades has shown a rise in the Earth's average surface temperature. Each decade is warmer than the previous decade average and the next decade will be warmer still. So now let's narrow in a little bit more to the historical changes in hot days and warm nights in the Southeast, where we all care about it. These are regional changes. And this region actually has had a different experience in the rest of the country. It's not experienced overall warming in the same way everyone else has. But the days and the nights are both warming. The bar charts on the left show the averages over the region by decade while the maps on the right show the trends for the individual weather stations. The daytime temperature increases don't show as clearly as the nighttime temperature increases. Um, since the early part of this record was very warm, you can see that there. But we do know since early 1960s, the days in the Southeast are warming at about the same rate as the rest of the country. In fact, 63% of Southeast cities are now experiencing some aspect of increasing heat waves. It's a higher percentage than any other region, even with, it, even with the high temperatures lower than they were in the 30s and the 50s. Now let's look at the bottom graph, the nighttime temperatures. The number of warm nights has doubled on average and is increasing at about three times the rate of the high temperatures. 
the reason the reason I always show um, high nighttime temperatures is because I interviewed a, uh, a rice farmer once who told me that his biggest concern was about the nighttime temperatures over 75 because he lo his rice can't rest. It loses, he loses the grain, he loses the output, he gets less output the warmer the nights. So together, the warm days and the warm nights impact both people and crops. So now let's look at what, what are we expecting? We're expecting more of what we're seeing. Um, I want you to notice though, the temperature difference between the lower and the higher scenarios. That's the left and the right. This is mid-century and late century. These are projections of what we think could happen. We are presently on the higher scenario. If we don't make some major changes soon, we could have a significantly different world, not for the better. And so look at the last, the high part of the last part of the century, the high, the high scenario, lower right. It's pretty, pretty significant. Precipitation is harder to project, but even if we have the same amount of precipitation with these higher temperatures, which is what this scenario shows for the end of the century, um, we will have less available water. And that was one of the re one of the issues we identified in the, the most recent US National Climate Assessment concern about water availability. If it's, if it's warmer, there's more evaporation and plants need more. You all are already quite familiar with, with what's underway related to sea level rise, but the projections are for significantly more sea level rise unless we make major changes in our behaviors related to burning fossil fuels. So let's move on to it's us. People are causing it this time. Why do I say that? Let's look first at how the earth has handled its natural changes. About every 125,000 years, the earth has had an ice age it, and, and has come out of it. And this is all due to natural forces, changes in the orbit, output of the sun, the volcanoes, all of these things show on here. The CO2 is the, line, is the blue line and you can see the CO2 and the temperature kind of go hand in hand. But the CO2 naturally ranges between about 200 and 300 parts per million, even with all the orbital changes and the solar cycles and all of those other things. Humans have really only prospered and become impactful at the end of this cycle. But I want you to look at where, I can't even see it actually the way my computer's set up, but where the, um, the CO2 is now, it's over 400 parts per million. This has happened in the last about 150 to 200 years. It's a significant change past the normal. So we're, let's, let's look at the attribution, who's to blame or where does it come from? Let's look at what's already impacted the observed atmosphere. This shows all the natural influences and the black jagged line, that's the observed temperature. Um, all of the influences are already accounted for and they go nowhere near where the observed temperature is. This is all the natural stuff that we saw just a moment ago. So now let's look at the human influences. The greenhouse gases alone that we give off when we burn fossil fuels would make the, obs the, the observed temperatures even higher than it already is. If we put all of these things together, all of these human drivers, all of the natural drivers, it's the only way we can come to together with seeing matching the observed temperature. It is clearly us. There's no other way it gets there. So how does it happen? The earth is surrounded by a blanket of gases that allow energy from the sun to, to um, reach the surface. Some of that energy is converted into heat, but most of it's reflected back out. But we're burning oil and gas. We are cutting forest farming in such a way that we're giving off a lot of gases. Carbon dioxide is the one that we measure the most, but methane, nitrous oxide, even water vapor, when it's a vapor, um, acts to hold in heat, actually making essentially the blanket of the atmosphere thicker. It holds in more heat. So what then happens? Um, it gets warmer. It leads to many other changes, rising temperatures, melting glaciers, thawing permafrost, and many more. And many of these are called positive feedbacks, but that doesn't mean good. That means more. And it's important to recognize that. And for the record, most of the heat is going into the oceans, which is why the temperature in the air isn't as warm as it would be otherwise. 
So all of these changes actually add up to being rather harmful. It's really disruptive to all kinds of things, to us and to other living things. This is an old slide, but I really like it because it's really clear that the drivers have impacts in many sectors and they're no longer than potential. Uh, this graphic was made for me by a colleague in 1998 when we were working on the first US National Climate Assessment. And at the time, we weren't sure of all of these impacts, but now we are. And in fact, we've, we didn't even think of insurance and tourism and infrastructure and legal issues. And all of these are prominent issues today. Let's look at one specific impact, the hardiness zones. Hardiness zones are determined by the cold temperatures. They are important to crops, to forests, to pests, whatever you want growing in your backyard is gonna matter what your hardiness zone is. Look at your state in 1990 and now look at it in 2015 and see the significant changes have already taken place in hardiness zones. It impacts what grows where, it impacts pests, it impacts lots of things. So I've chosen two of the key messages from the most recent US National Climate Assessment to highlight. Um, and I'm only gonna mention one of the issues in each of the, these two key messages. But this one, we're gonna talk about the, um, the, we're very concerned about the potential for vector-borne diseases, which is demonstrated in the graphic here on the right. Um, th this region has the greatest potential to expand the vector-borne region and time frame in which they could be um, vis um, active. So this mosquito habitat, this particular mosquito that this one, this study is about, um, carries dengue fever and Zika, for example. Another specific risk for this region is highlighted for rural areas. Um, it has, we have the potential for the loss of 570 million labor hours per year by the end of the century. They would show up in agriculture, forestry, fishing, construction, transportation, all of the outdoor, outdoor issues, um, businesses that are really important for rural communities and all of us actually, because it's even transportation and construction. If we don't make changes, this is the kind of future that we are heading for. And scientists agree, virtually all clients, scientists agree in all of this information that I've been passing on to you. So to assess the scientific agreement, uh, agreement, let's start with the gold standard of climate information. That's the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's an international body. They call together on average 2,500 of the most reputable climate scientists around the world to periodically get together and assess all the climate work that's been done since the previous meeting. They make summaries for policymakers. They put information together to support choosing science-based approaches for policy and technology. There have been five documents. The next one's out in 2020. Um, and they are the gold standard and they're free and available on the web. Another way to look at how scientists agree is how many reputable peer reviewed science papers reject the idea of man-made climate change. It's pretty much negligible. So after all this bad news, I'm actually happy to say there is some hope. There are two responses that you can make to a changing climate. One is to address the causes and that's mitigation. And the other is to address the impacts and that's adaptation. So I wanna make another note here that mitigation means something different when you're talking about climate than it does when you're talking about disasters. Mitigation to a climate scientist means fewer gases in the air. So let's, how do we do this? There are two ways we can keep them out by energy efficiency and green energy. So using less energy or energy that doesn't give off carbon dioxide, or you can take them out. You can plant trees, you can maintain wetlands, you can use no-till farming, or you can use new technologies that are being developed for carbon capture. We can all take these actions now and in the future. We can save or make some money but it still is going to take time to get all of this out of the atmosphere. So we need to start now. <clears throat> we are on the high trajectory. Remember I mentioned that the high trajectory is the red line on both of these graphics. 
In the left, it's the carbon emissions, and in the right, it's the projected temperatures. Remember, they kind of go together. So we are not yet beyond the point of no return. We are at a place where we could easily make changes and get ourselves off of this high trajectory. But we need to start now. We need to reduce our emissions so that we have less heat and fewer changes that we need to deal with. So who can do this? We can all do this. We can all make similar changes and choices. As individuals, as communities, as governments, as businesses, we can all help. We're not doing enough yet to avoid the worst of the impacts, but we could be. Then this, the final option then is, is to um, take actions to avoid the impacts. That's called adaptation. And adaptations are location and issue specific. You can incorporate future climates or likely climate futures into your planning, or you could approach and take specific action on specific problems. For example, if you have a flooding problem, there are only a few options. You could protect with a levee or a seawall, you could accommodate by raising the structure, or you could retreat by moving out of the way. But whatever choice you make it's, is made specific for your community because some communities want levees and some communities are raising buildings. Whatever you choose is for your building, for your community. You have to make that choice. The thing about um, adaptations is they are often ongoing and iterative over time. They're not necessarily new actions. We might be just applying them at a two, in a new place in a new way. We can learn from others, but rarely can we do exactly what someone else has done to address the problem because they are issue and location specific. So the story is it's real, it's us, it's harmful, scientists agree and there's hope. And I'm delighted to, to present today. Thank you. Dr. Lynn Carter, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. And so it's a good foundation to start this conversation that we're gonna hand over to Heather now, who has, has lived this in different ways and through being a mayor, through working at the EPA and through being an activist in many ways uh, across her community and communities around the country, she's gonna dive a little into the intersectionality that, that Dr. Lynn just laid out for us. And so Heather, looking forward to hearing. Thanks so much, Brenda, and thanks, Dr. Lynn, for, for laying that out so well. And thank you for joining us. This is really exciting. And uh, long overdue, we should have been talking about this, particularly in the South, for quite some time. And I appreciate, uh, Bernadette, how we sort of started out and talking about what, what's the reality and how we're breaking down some of the myths and stereotypes. So that's what I want to talk about. Let's break down some of those Southern myths and stereotypes and let's dig into the storytelling aspect and why we should own it. It is amazing to me that we don't talk about climate as much in the South because we are natural storytellers. Think about it. If you are in any of the Southern states, there is very, very rare opportunities where you stop and you interview somebody and they're not giving you their whole life history along with the stories that go with it because it's just who we are. It's how we talk and it, it is what makes us so special and what connects us to the very land. At the same time, unfortunately, we attempt to address climate issues in the ways that other geographies do, and it doesn't quite fit us. So the whole idea that Southerners and people of color in the South are not interested or are not really into climate, it's completely false. We just talk about it different. Take, for example, if we talk about, or a, 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 great, a great story <laughs> uh, about when I was mayor, uh, I had two 500 year flood events. So that's twice where I had in my community events that we had never expected to have and certainly did not have the resources to be able to deal with. On one side of the levee of Greenville, Mississippi, I was standing there with uh, reporters and journalists and waiters uh, in the water with their news cameras all wrapped up uh, talking about all of the extreme weather and interviewing from CNN to MSNBC to Fox. On the other side of the levee were little old ladies who were watering their grass. Why? That just shows you how big of a difference there was in terms of what people thought of climate and how it impacted them. That same event, I drove down the street because, of course, when you have high water and you have levees, you have animals that are trying to escape and get to high land. So part of my responsibility as mayor was to let people know, if you see a deer running down the street, don't shoot it. 
I drove through a local neighborhood and said, hey, you know, this is not hunting season. And once again, some of those good Mississippi folks from the Delta reminded me, oh, Mayor, don't worry about it. That meat's not good this time of year. We know in our people, we have to give them credit for the connections that we have historically and always had to the environment, to the land, and what we know as the best things for it. So talking about it in a way that impacts us and reflects both our appreciation, our history, is a way to really elevate climate. Let's talk about how it intersects just about every social justice issue of our time. You cannot point to an issue that we are dealing with in America today yesterday or 100 years ago that does not in some way touch climate. We think often as climate, environmental justice, climate change, the climate crisis, as all one issue that fits into a box. I want to change that for you. Instead of thinking of climate change as an issue in the box, the actual table that the box sits on, that's climate. And on top of that table, the box has all of these different elements. So when, as Dr. Lin spoke about vector-borne diseases and Zika, I immediately think about how in 2015, uh, when I was regional administrator for EPA in the Southeast region, the region that is, as she showed on her map, most likely and often hit the hardest, I was pregnant with my first child. And all of a sudden, I could not travel to the majority of my region where I worked, the eight southeastern states, a quarter of the nation's population, because I was a part of the impacted class of people who could be disproportionately harmed if I was bitten by a mosquito. It became very, very real to me that because of the geographic location, I was more susceptible and I was putting my child at risk just because of what was happening in climate. I felt and talked to mothers entirely in an entire different way. Having conversations and laying on top of that, what the workforce was dealing with, because remember, I was a regional administrator. I got to work inside and even before remote work was popular, I could remote work. But what about those women who worked in the agricultural industry in Florida? who worked in the orange groves or the flower farms, who not only were dealing with Zika, but were also dealing with toxic chemicals and could sit and discuss ad nauseum how difficult it was to have to go to work every day and then be covered with toxic chemicals and not be able to go home and hug your children. These, again, are environmental issues that layer on top of what's happening in our communities. When we think about extreme weather and sea level rise and what happens when there are tornadoes and floods and how those disproportionately impact communities of color, rural areas, poorer parts of our country, the Southeast has mostly rural communities. And so the way that we experience and talk about not only the impact of these uh, issues and storms on our communities, but the response to them is extremely important to help educate the rest of the country on how to deal with it. So all that happened in New Orleans and all the lessons that we learned from Hurricane Katrina, if we don't tell those stories, then the people who live in Iowa and had to deal with derechos this past year, a word that I didn't really even knew was related to climate until 2020, they could not understand how to effectively go about response, what you should expect from a FEMA, what you should expect from your local and state governments, and then how to recover afterwards if they don't hear our stories. Hearing our stories is what connects the dots between the social justice issues that we experience that underlie climate change. There are so many of them and so many studies, it's hard to put them together in one piece. But I submit to you that you cannot come up with a story, an idea, nothing at all that does not have an underlying climate theme. We've got to learn to, to realize, you know, we could really own this if we wanted to. 
We could really look at climate and how we talk about climate as a way to show forth the expertise of the Southeast while giving people an opportunity to really engage in policy decisions that they've been left out of simply because stereotypically people don't think we care about it. We know that's a lot different. I've had great conversations with farmers in Mississippi who know more about water conservation than anybody else in the country. Why? They've had to do it with or without money. So they know some of the best methods of not only conserving water and using it wisely on their crops, but also the ebbs and flows of the history of the Mississippi River, the creeks and streams that run into them, how the seasons have changed and how they recognize that, how more water comes in the storms and what they have to do to ensure that they are protecting their own crops while ensuring the protection of life and property around them. These are some of the best experts that simply need a platform to share their expertise and share it in the way that they know how to share it through the language that they understand. It's funny how often I hear biblical scripture talked about when people are telling stories about how they feel in their communities. Because see, we are in the Bible belt. So it's easy to hear somebody say, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, or yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, or how I lay down by green grass, because this is part of our culture. It's also a telling tale when people are ready to talk about how they would like to do things in the environment and with conservation and with growing and with planning. But, you know, it's really hard when you hear environmentalists tell you, you should plant your own garden when you don't own the property to plant the garden in. It overlaps with housing. It overlaps with social justice. It overlaps with even police brutality because we've seen studies that have come out of Princeton University. And there was a wonderful New York Times piece that was done, I believe back in 2003, if I'm not mistaken, and you can follow up with me to get that exact space, but that talked about the relationships between extreme heat and violence and how all across this planet of ours, as the heat increases, we're seeing more and more in instances of violent activity. And that immediately brings up images to people when you talk to them about it, particularly in the South, of the history of violence in our country and in our region, and how we want to make sure we don't continue to exasperate that. It is very poignant for all of us to continue to make sure that as we tell these stories, we also tell the solutions. We talk about the wonderful way how our Sun Belt, the auto industry has increased, how there are jobs and economy is and can be improved by putting jobs in this particular region that have to do with clean energy and clean power because we have people who can work those jobs. And more importantly, know the area, know the geographics and understand the value of appreciating nature, the environment and how we coexist together. And so there are a multitude of ways, a multitude of stories that we can continue to tell. And now is the time to do it. Like I like to say, climate environmental justice is sexy right now. Everybody's talking about it and everybody wants to be a part doing something for the future, for the world, and not left out. The South has a lot to say. We've experienced it, we've been a part of it, and our stories have helped us to survive even when other people were not paying attention to us. So elevating those stories and showing how people can learn from what we have experienced and at the same time help benefit the communities that we live in through um, clean energy innovation, environmental techniques that maybe would be good for other parts of the country and even other parts of the globe, give us an opportunity to really be a part of the policy making and the solutions that we know will aid our children and generations to come. So I'm glad we're having this conversation. I look forward to questions because there's so much that we can dig into, so many untold stories that we have yet to tap into, and so much of the country that's waiting to hear what we have to say, and there's a lot of it. 
Thank you so much, Heather. And you can see now why we're so excited for this panel. We've got Heather and Dr. Lynn, just so much information to dig into. And so what I'm gonna try and do is balance People start sending more of your questions in, but we also do have some of those previous questions, as Mark said. And I'm going to start with Heather here, because as we were prepping for this, a few things you said the other day that I think really will resonate with this crowd. Um, talking about the language and not being afraid and using your own words, not having to conform to scientific words when telling these stories. I thought it was so interesting how you said, don't be afraid to tell stories. There are so many of them. So I want to see from you how, I mean, you gave us a few examples of what has worked. When you were learning more about this subject matter and diving in, what were some of the areas that I think were, I don't want to say most surprising to you, but really stood out? Because for people just getting up to speed on this, that may be helpful for them too. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate that question because when I started out, I didn't even know I was doing environmental work. I had no idea. That this was it, that this was environmental work. In fact, it was Lisa Jackson, who was the first African American administrator for the US EPA, who visited my city when I was a mayor. And she said, "You know, this is environmental justice work you're doing." And I'm like, "No, Lisa, it's not." No, she said, "Really, it is." And um, I, I begin to think back through all of my experiences and touches to nature, and the very fact that I was raised on the banks of the Mississippi River. Greenville sits right on Lake Ferguson and right on the river and just understood certain things as a matter of growing up as a child in an agrarian society and culture. So for example, I didn't take botany or biology, but I could tell you when um, cotton was gonna be harvested by the smell and the fact that it was football season in the SEC. That's how you knew. And everybody knew that. So everybody knew how to have that conversation. Folks also knew when you see the tractors out late at night and the fact that there are lights on those tractors that those farmers are trying to get products out of the field because of an upcoming storm. We knew when the river rose and that, that usually that came at the time when there had been a really big snow up in Chicago or our cousins and friends up in the Northeast were talking about how cold it had been. Our parents were usually talking about, oh man, that means we're gonna have some flooding down here in the spring because of the connectivity and the family and the language that we talk about. And so when I say telling those stories, that's how I came to recognize that this has been a part of my life my entire life. We just talk about it differently. When I would Google, what does an environmentalist look like? All I saw was images of white people hugging trees. And I couldn't relate to that <laughs> because it wasn't my experience. But I realized that culturally, my experience was communal. It was people of color. It was my godmother who did own her house and have a, a, a garden in the backyard with greens and tomatoes. It was constantly interweaving all of these spaces that I touched every single day and recognizing that, no, I have a very valid and real voice in this. And it's a voice that should be heard by many, many people. And so to all of our journalists joining us, those are all stories to tell. If you're looking for story ideas, if you're newer to this space, or even if you've been here a long time and you're looking for the next great story, all of those are ideas you can dig into. And with that, I'm going to shift it over to Dr. Lynn here for a moment because you've studied this for so long. I mean, one of your slides was 1998 with all of these issues. So the fundamentals of this have been around for a while. And I'm curious for you, from your point of view, what are some of the stories that are, I mean, there's a lot of stories that aren't being told to the exact level, but what stories do you think need to be told more that, that we're missing or stories that are out there and they're just not making the, the climate connection, even though we're talking about it all the time and it's really a climate story. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think you might, I, I, love, what, I love what Heather was just talking about that climate is connected to so many aspects. But it's also important to recognize that the climate impacts that you feel where you are might not be the same climate impacts that someone else feels. And so it, it might have the same kind of a driver, you know, a, cha a changing temperature or something like that, but your impacts might be something else. It's like I was, I was very surprised when I, I, we did a survey when I was full-time at, at LSU uh, with many, many people along in our region about what they were most concerned about. I was totally surprised when that rice farmer told me 75 degree nights really impact his crop. 
Well, 75 degree nights impact his crop to the point where it's really cost him a lot of money. So, but 75 degree nights actually can also impact other people, can impact people when they don't get any cooling, when there's not enough cooling at night. And what if there's what if you're you're in a in a poverty situation and you can't afford to um, have the cooling that you need, or there isn't enough energy on the grid to be able to make that cooling available? It it there are connections to everything. Almost everything I I think of as a cascading impact. You start with one impact and then you see where it goes, which is what I was talking about, you know, the losing the ice and then the permafrost and all. Those are kind of cascading impacts. So what I used to say to my students is, then what? You see a problem, you see an issue, ask yourself, then what? Because that's sort of the next step, maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe the next the next cascade you know it might be increasing temperatures it might be vector borne diseases because there are more people now not in rural areas but in your you have such a growing population in your cities now that there are many more places for there to be standing water you know that you don't really think about make sure you don't let containers outside of the buildings hold water because that's where the mosquitoes will be but there are many more of those who would think of that you know what about if, you know in a different disease if there's a different if you're in a different location maybe the storm surge is the issue or you know how how people how communities respond always surprised me um there were two different communities almost right next to each other in louisiana one wanted a levy one did not want a levy they raised every house and I don't mean raised by do knocking it down. I mean raised by raising every house, every building because they were on Lake, Ch Lake Pontchartrain and they wanted to be able to see the lake. So so culture. All, oh, sorry. These are all story ideas. for Absolutely. All That's why I'm saying their, their culture matters in the choices that you make. And so then how do you respond? And that's why I also say that, you know, um, climate change really impacts you differently, but you can, um, maybe it sounds the same, it's a flooding issue, but it's not the same. It's a really different issue depending on where you are. And so your choices need to be location, issue, culture. Um, if you have the political will, do you have enough money? Do you have the expertise? Do you have, what do you have that you can deal, use to deal with that problem? It's not gonna be the same everywhere, but you can learn a lot from how other people thought about it. Yes. Before, I'm sorry, I'm getting no, pauses. One other <laughs> quick thing. I was the liaison to all of the regions for the first U.S. National Climate Assessment. There were 20 regions. Sometimes they didn't know how to do something. So they would call me up and say, I can't tell the agency that's funding me. I don't know how to do this, but I don't know how to do this. So I would say, well, this region did it like this, and this region did it like that, and that region did it like that. And so by the time we got off the phone, they had a whole bunch of ideas that they could then use to start themselves. And that's what we can all do. We can all learn from what everybody else is doing, but we may not be able to take, in most cases cannot, take and cookie cutter a response. It won't work the same. And that's why we're really doing this focus on the South, because even in the South, there's all these stories. So it's very different than the Northeast and the West. And so oh, it's, uh, Bernadette, it's like, I, if I could just give you one quick example, yeah. I'll make it really, really fast. The, the story I was waiting for and I didn't get to read. Um, and that was after Texas. So the winter storms in Texas took place and there were all of these stories about what was going on and what was happening in communities that weren't getting their power back. There was this other conversation that was going on among communities of color when the power was being restored. Remember we heard about all the rolling blackouts and how the electric companies were sort of just rolling it along, it was happening. But the people who were on the ground and the story I was waiting to hear was about how black and Latino folks who were in the trucks and were responsible for turning on the electricity in, in the different spaces knew exactly what was being turned on and when. Mm -hmm. It was 
constant conversation within, within communities of color. And I found that once people actually realized it, it was four days after people on the ground actually knew it. So imagine when your Latino uncle comes home and he, you have, he has no power at his house and you have no power at your house, but he just drove across town to a white neighborhood to make sure they had power. Like I was waiting for that story to come out because it was happening and it was a story. And that I think exactly what Dr. Lynn means is understanding the culture, understanding what's happening and where to go to connect the dots. And I hope that addresses Shari, like what you thought, um, uh, there was a question of like what story ideas are written on a on the bra slip. That's like the thing that's written on the bra slip uh, that's written on the note that's a slide across the pew to say, did you know that my cousin was over there in the other neighborhood turning on the electricity? What they said on the news was not right. Mm -hmm. Kind of information that we have and we should share. Well, I mean, I can speak to the two of you all day. I do know that we have the rest of this to get to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it over to Mark. But real quick before I do, thank you so much. I'm going to share in the chat another question that had come in previously. Both of you feel free to jump in and answer that question in the chat as we continue this question here on Zoom. So thank you so much. And Mark, I'm going to hand it to you. Indeed, thank you very, very much uh, to both of you. And you'll be sticking with us, of course, as we continue. But we're going to shift now to talk to a couple of journalists, because, of course, today's session is for journalists to help all of us do better on this story. So let's talk about how we translate this kind of information into what we actually do on a daily basis. So um, we're going to start with Mark Schlefstein. As I said earlier, uh, Mark is a Pulitzer Prize winner. And he uh, has been covering these kinds of issues at the uh, first at the Times Picayune in New Orleans, now owned by also the Advocate uh, newspaper in New Orleans for 37 years, including a very prescient uh, series in 2002 called Washing Away that essentially predicted what was going to happen under Katrina. Not enough people listened to it. Mark, um, it's great to have you and uh, thanks for doing this. So tell us a little bit about uh, your experience there in the newsroom. You have been saying for a long time exactly what Heather uh, and uh, Dr. Lynn just said and what we say at Covering Climate Now and Bernadette says at Climate Matters, which is climate change is a story for every beat in the newsroom. I know you've been preaching that, but it's one thing to preach that, it's another for the congregation to listen. So how has that worked out within the uh, newsroom there at the Times Picayune and The Advocate? Well, uh, let me come to this uh, both from uh, our own personal experiences at the, at the Times Picayune, but also in terms of the broader audience, because I was a, a member of the board of the Society of Environmental Journalists for, I don't know, 17 years. Um, uh, the, the reality is that there are um, uh, well-inbred cultures in newsrooms, and in many newsrooms, uh, there really is a, a disconnect between reporters who are covering climate all the time and reporters who are covering business, for instance, all the time. And that's, that's true in our own, uh, our, our own newsroom even today, uh, which we're working on. Um, one of the big things that, uh, that is a concern for, for all newsrooms is that they need to recognize right now that we really are on the cusp of a huge change that is occurring in the economy where much more of the economy is going to be driven by climate change related changes in business and industry. And the result of that is going to be economics. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do is explain to the reporters who generally cover announcements of new companies that are out there um, that are coming in, uh, new petrochemical facility and things like that is, is at the very beginning, go ask that question about what are they doing to respond to climate change? Uh, in our state, it's even more important because the governor actually has a, a climate change task force that is looking at ma making major changes in state law to deal with some of these key issues. And um, in many cases, what, turn what turns out to be just a, a story about, oh, gee, you know, there's a billion dollars being put into this new facility and it's lots of new jobs. If they dig down a couple of of notches, they can find out, well, actually a third of that amount of money actually is going into um, uh, uh, 
environmental uh, regulation at the plant, uh, changes in the way that the, pa that the products are being made, and disposal of, of carbon um, even. And indeed, we actually have in Louisiana the creation right now of at least one facility that is building a climate capture storage facility on the western part of the state. Another billion dollar project, um, uh, something that you know nobody was thinking about even 10 years ago. And now it's something that uh, uh, both the states and the governors are, are looking at nationwide. So that's that's you know, that's part of it is you know, educating our own newsroom, both reporters and editors who are not used to this. Um, you know, sometimes it's even as silly as um, as going up to the sports reporter and saying, you know, I, I know a really good SEC story. Why don't you find out what climate change is doing to humidity and what that's doing to practices? And that's, that's I mean, it's a climate story. And why is that happening? Why is there so much humidity? And why, why are they having real problems with practices uh, for, for football in the fall? Well, because temperatures are, are continuing to be higher because there's more moisture in the air. Why is that? Well, it's all climate affected. And so what was the response of that particular colleague and your newsroom in general? And are there lessons that other journalists on this call can learn about how to uh, spread this message to their colleagues in the newsroom in a, an effective way? Well, I haven't gotten to the, to the climate sports story yet with the, with the reporter who's doing that. So that's something that I will be, be looking at this year. Uh, uh, the other stuff is, uh, is an ongoing discussion that we're having. Part of it has already been answered by uh, one of the reporters who is doing some of the business stuff has been assigned to our environmental team half time. So, so that is happening. And uh, there's more coordination back and forth between us and the business news staff over how we're doing things. Speaking of business, Mark, you're reporting obviously from Louisiana, which has been a long time oil state as your neighbors in Texas and Oklahoma are. Uh, and that's not just your economy, that's also your culture. I remember when I was first down in, in Louisiana reporting after Hurricane Katrina, I was shocked, I'll admit, to discover that you actually have an annual shrimp and petroleum festival. Absolutely. That's not culture, I don't know what is. So, <laughs> um, but obviously that can create some potential tensions because a lot of the economy is still driven by oil and gas. And yet you guys are also, as we sadly saw with Katrina and so many others, you're on the front lines of a lot of those impacts of climate. Um, so how do you and your colleagues in the newsroom, how do you balance that in a way that, that again, the reporters on this call can learn from? Well, we talk about it, the, 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 uh, energy schizophrenia of, of Louisiana. The, the reality is, and I'll give you a, you know, a good example is uh, um, with the BP oil spill, um, uh, people in South Louisiana were put out of their two jobs, not their job, but their two jobs when the spill occurred. The first one was uh, uh, fishers um, in, in the New Orleans area couldn't go fishing because all the fishing areas were closed. Well, that's half their time. The other half of their time is they were working, you know, uh, 12 days on, 12 days off in the offshore oil business. And there was a moratorium on that. So they couldn't work there either. So they lost both their jobs. And that's something that we all have to have to take a look at um, as reporters and make sure that we understand that there are these, these really strange uh, aspects that are going on. The, um, uh, the other key issue here, again, getting back to our governor and his uh, task force, is that there really is right now a, 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 an effort in the state to, to attempt to address what some of those um, what some of those issues are and how we can move forward. Uh, the, the obvious concerns uh, for South Louisiana is uh, actually loss of land, loss of wetlands outside the levee systems that are reducing the effectiveness of levees. Um, uh, in after Hurricane Katrina, um, um, the connection between uh, wetlands restoration and levees was made directly uh, at the state level. 
uh, even in the state's um, constitution where um, oil and gas money coming into the state from offshore is now used only for restoration or levies uh, constitutionally. Um, so those are, you know, those are, are key issues. Um, the state is attempting to look at a, at a variety of different ways, little snippets of uh, where climate is affecting uh, in the industry and, and businesses. Um, agriculture, forestry, landfills, um, the, the electric power industry, um, the petrochemical industry and, and what's gonna be done there where you have the, the dual benefit of reducing emissions and helping the state meet its new goals of the, the Paris climate, the climate Accords for reducing emissions, but also reducing uh, other emissions while you're doing that, that it ha affect health uh, for uh, uh, fence line communities of color. So uh, those are key things. And then just, you know, um, what are we gonna be doing to, to deal with uh, uh, the old, um, uh, all these old houses that make up New Orleans, how, how do you make them more climate friendly in, in today's world? And, and how, to, how do you regulate that as you're moving forward? So there, you know, any, any aspect of our economy um, or our culture uh, really uh, crosses with uh, climate change. Thanks, Mark. Let me bring in Lindsay now. Lindsay Gilpin, of course, is the editor in chief and co-founder of Southerly. Fascinating magazine. Lindsay, will you sort of just take us through your and your colleagues' journey about, you know, what is suddenly, why did you decide on the particular collaborative model that you have? And in particular, why did you decide that environmental justice has to be such a key theme of this uh, uh, publishing venture? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, First of all, I wish I had a co-founder. My life would be so much easier right now. <laughs> it was just me. <laughs> that would be great. Um, no, we have a, a pretty good team building over here now. So I started Southerly, um, well, I started as a newsletter, newsletter first because I was freelancing about environmental issues and climate change in the South. Um, and, and I launched it as a publication in 2018. And it really came out of a seeing a huge gap in consistent, reliable reporting on not just climate, but everything that intersects with that, as we talked about so much in this region. And um, that that even as a freelancer, I was trying to land stories at the national level about things that were happening in the South. And um, it, was, it, it was difficult. <laughs> it was really difficult to land those stories. And a lot of times um, uh, some kind of terrible adjectives about like the desolate place and the um, depressing towns of the region and like the kind of typical pictures you see about, you know, like a cloudy, foggy Appalachia or, um, a, you know, deserted town in Mississippi. Like it was a lot of that. And I was sort of like fighting that constantly. And I thought to myself, like, there's just that we need a consistent uh, we need more consistent and reliable coverage of, of these issues and how they intersect. And really, you know, in a region like um, like this one, um, what Mark is talking about on the Gulf Coast is not so different than what's happening, um, you know, as the coal industry declines in Appalachia or as the agriculture industry changes in the Delta. So um, really launched it out of, out of that. And from the beginning and really since um, in the last couple of years, I've, I've um, evolved this a lot more into turning Southerly into a publication that really always collaborates with other news outlets. So most news outlets, as you all probably know, do not have a Mark Schleff scene. I feel like I say that a lot. And um, you know, don't have someone covering climate change and how it's affecting people and the economy all the time. And, and so when, when that's not the case, it's really hard to figure out and like everything feels more abstract, you know, and especially when you're not on the coast, when you're in, when you're inland and you're seeing, you know, changes in your, your crops, if you're a farmer or, you know, you're seeing a lot of flooding, like there's been in Eastern Kentucky or, you know, something like the winter storm that happened. And um, so ever since the beginning, we partnered often with, um, you know, like 
legacy sort of newspapers, um, public radio stations, and then now more and more we're doing doing uh, collaborations. Sometimes they're starting to do longer term ones, but have done a lot of one off things um, on just with with publications that are trying to reach specific audiences. So, for instance. Um, a Spanish language outlet in North Carolina called En Lasse Latino NC. We did um, several stories on how uh, farm workers were impacted by hurricanes, a couple of hurricanes, Matthew, I guess it was um, a few years ago. And, um, and really trying to dig into the fact that we can offer a regional perspective to show the context of what's happening in the South um, and why it matters for, for, for the economy and for um, and for um, you know racial justice, and also really try to reach the people that we want to reach. Um, that the people, as Heather was saying earlier, they like need to see these stories. You know, the people that I, you know, I'm not doing this so that it can circulate on Twitter. <laughs> I'm doing it so that the people who um, need access to the information about FEMA or about how to you know, get grant money like after a, like rental assistance after a storm or need to better understand how um, like heat is changing the way that they live or, they're, or especially around public health, um, you know, whether it's the petrochemical industry or um, water, um, water quality wherever in this region, because um, that's a pretty widespread problem as you might imagine, um, that, that they're able to, to get that information and to do something with it. And, you know, again, as Heather said really well earlier, environmental justice and, you know, and racial justice and, and economic justice in general is just, you can't ha talk about anything in this region or in general <laughs> without talking about those things. Like there is no climate story without that. Um, and, you know, there's, it, it's always, you know, you, so often we see um, stories about uh, like urban areas and I focus a lot on rural communities because that's just something that like is consistently undercovered um, and overlooked as to how rural communities are dealing with, with climate effects. And then um, the other part about that is, is obviously communities of color, black and indigenous communities in particular um, throughout the, the Gulf Coast, we focus a lot on throughout um, North Carolina, the Mississippi Delta. It's like you're seeing, um, you know, that, those stories, it, it just the amount of pitches I get from writers seeing this in their own communities and trying to like give voice to people who have, this is their lived experience. And this, um, this is something that, uh, that, that has not been covered enough and the, the dots have not been connected enough. And so I, I feel really strongly that um, covering environmental justice in a way that, that meets people where they're at um, to talk about, you know, what, what's happening to them and then um, the solutions to those problems that, you know, sometimes they're large scale solutions that seem really difficult um, and like they'll never get done. And then there's the kind of grassroots community driven work that's been going on for decades, it's just no one's covered it, right? And so once we start bringing those things to the surface, you know, folks in Eastern Kentucky can see what people in Jackson are doing about their water, right? And we, they can act, actually like start communicating and start um, coming up with ways to act, pressure you know, their local officials or, um, or get more stories out there. So I think that's really the power in what Southerly is doing and also what more focus on environmental coverage in general can do. Thank you. I'm going to take the liberty of the uh, moderator here to begin to segue here into our full out Q and A. We we'll put the first question to you, Lindsay, mm -hmm. because it's it's perfect for this. And I say this as someone who also grew up on a farm uh, south of the Mason Dixon line and have long been troubled by the fact that so much of the journalistic profession is urban focused. And when they do do rural stories, there is an unfortunate tendency to stereotype. So the question that came in earlier in this session is um, this relates to what you were saying earlier, Bernadette, about how people want to know. Uh, and the question was, well, people may say that to a pollster that they want to know, but do they actually click on those stories? So Lindsay, let me put you on the spot. You know, you cover a lot of those uh, racial justice, gender justice, economic justice, climate justice stories, but do people actually read them? So I think this is an interesting question because I think um, the journalism industry at large is um, hasn't been the best <laughs> at reaching the people that we actually, like I was saying, actually need to have read those stories, like um, because of 
just the it, like where it's centered and the way it's run, and also just because of the, the huge cuts, right, that have happened, um, and and the decline of local news, and and I I think that we just in general grossly underestimate the amount of interest there is in these stories. Like I I think that the journalism industry at large does not give our audiences the benefit of the doubt in this situation where like they know what's happening in the places that they live and they want to know about it. But the way we often present these stories, if we present them, right, we're talking so much about how it's undercovered that, um, that like they're not seeing themselves in it. And they don't, if they don't see themselves in it, then they don't want to read it, right? And, and I think that is, is extremely important. And the, like, the, the challenge though, right, is like I started a digital <laughs> outlet and now I'm trying to reach people like that, that that don't have access maybe to the internet or um, or can't can't get the information in, for whatever reason or maybe don't speak English as their first language. Um, and so what we've been working on and what a lot of you know Texas Observer is doing a lot of this in rural Texas um, and uh, several other outlets like Outlier Media is doing this obviously in Detroit um, in Los Latino in North Carolina where we basically are trying to present the information in a different fashion. So we've held a lot of events, um, virtual and before the pandemic in person to talk about what people wanna see in their coverage, what um, questions they have about like hurricane recovery, for instance, or farming, or um, we were working on like community newsletters in North Carolina to distribute through the library system because people go there to use the internet um, and they go there to get information. Um, and also, you know, text-based services are becoming really popular, I think, among um, among outlets where that's how people are getting information, just answering questions or trying to investigate things. And so I think like that's the stuff that we have to, to do alongside the traditional journalism to make sure people read it. Um, you know, we have to answer their basic questions that we haven't <laughs> gotten to answer for so long about climate change and the changes that they're seeing around them. And, and then we can kind of move into like, all right, let's figure out like how we actually do something about it. Um, so I really like I, I feel strongly that that is that's the way the journalism industry should go and um, and it is going. It's just um, it, it's, it takes a lot of time and effort and money to do that, obviously. Um, so but I definitely a, think the interest is there. Sorry, go ahead. I'll take that as a provisional yes, that people are beginning <laughs> to read it, but we have to do a lot more to make it reader friendly to them and meet them where they are. So let me now switch to uh, some other questions that have come in and I wanna start this one with Mark. Um, Mark S and uh, invite others if they if they wish. But um, here's a question, you know, very practical journalistic question. What advice do you have when you're reporting a story? What advice do you have for talking with sources who may be skeptical of climate science? Um, we have those and um, uh, you have to recognize what their skepticism comes from. Um, uh, again, in Louisiana, one of the ironies is that uh, people are more concerned about the effects of climate change than the causes. And so wetlands loss is a perfect example of that. If you talk to a, a number of people, they're, they're not going to believe that climate itself is the only reason for, for it happening although they recognize that sea level rise is one of the reasons and um, um, they're more interested in, in, in what's happening and what happens to them as a result rather than, oh gee, is this all because of that? Um, they're more likely to look at other reasons. And of course, in South Louisiana, um, uh, even sea level rise was not the key driver of, of wetlands loss. Uh, for quite a while, it's becoming more and more the key driver today and in the future will most definitely be. So it's our job to try to explain that, uh, but to listen to those uh, people and, and attempt to get what their, what their arguments are and, uh, and to accurately portray their concerns while also accurately portraying the science. Dr. Lin, could you quickly uh, weigh in on this? Because I've heard this so many times in my own reporting, uh, what Mark S. just said that, that um, you know, you talk to people who they can see by looking out their windows or out into their fields that 
climate change is happening, but they don't want to talk about why it's happening. And we see this actually at the national level now with many congressional Republicans. But doesn't it make a difference whether you understand why it's happening in terms of how you are going to approach climate policies? If you think that this is not because of climate change, how can you make good policy? Or am I getting the science wrong on this? I don't think you, can you hear me? Did I turn myself back on? Okay. We hear you. I don't think you're getting. I don't think you're getting it wrong at all. And um, when I was at LSU, I often had that problem um, with people. But they have no problem if you talk about issues and adaptations. Um, you can often get people involved in the conversation by showing what's actually already happened that they've experienced. And it's hard to argue with what they've experienced and then talk about what's coming. What's, what's very likely coming, uh, the projections, and then talk about how you can deal with some of the individual problems. But after a while, people actually, at least this is experience that I've had. I never went, <clears throat> I never went to a community and gave a presentation, and I did this all the time, that someone didn't ask me to come to their community next because I explained it in such a way that it was hard to refute. A lot of times people refute this because they just don't actually see the real information. Um, <clears throat> and so if you can give people, if you can respond to someone with actual data and information, if they trust you, they have to trust you as the source before anything else. Uh, but if they trust you, if you're a, a known source, eventually they'll come around. But it's, it's very difficult when you have people who, who have no problem with telling untruths. Um, and and that, you know, that's very hard. That, how, do you, how do you deal with that? I just always told the truth. And uh, more and more people wanted to hear you know, what really was happening. What do we know? What don't we know? Uh, because we don't know everything, clearly, but we know a lot. Um, and it's... You know, you just have to, you, you, you can't argue with someone who won't listen. Use words, okay. you know, use, use words that are not automatically off-putting. Yep. You know, be careful of how you say things. Um, and sometimes you can get through and sometimes you can't. If they don't want to listen, they're not going to listen. Well, and that's where the, the world has changed significantly in recent months. We now have, as I said earlier, a climate realist in the White House. For the last four years, we've had a climate denier, but who also, and this is something for those, those of us in the press, um, that climate denier in the Oval Office also had a huge megaphone in the right-wing media ecosystem. So that's a problem for us. Let me ask a question now to Heather, Tony, if I may. And this comes from one of our um, earlier RSVP questions. Quote, there's a long history of black Americans in North Carolina where I report and the rest of the South who are being forced to live and relocate to flood prone areas. Can you please give us some tips on how to report on environmental racism in a way that is concise, but yet fully encapsulates the modern media audience? I love that. I love that because there's so many ways to tell that story. And you're absolutely right. Uh, those challenges in the Carolinas um, are everything from black and brown, well, black folks living under the cloud of CAFOs, control animal feed operations, where they're literally in the pollution and, and existing in it every single day to what I listed earlier is green gentrification. And green gentrification can look like two different things. It can be you being in an area that um, now has such sea level rise and the insurance cost is so high that um, black and brown people are moved out and rich white people move in, or it can be the reverse, what was just uh, said it as an example, pushing Black folks to areas that are prone to have um, uh, 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 flooding or what we call sacrifice zones. So that is another way to talk about the issue, to say, are, are we creating or is our government or are corporations creating actual sacrifice zones where not only people are living in flood zones, but also the housing is subpar? Is there a dis, disinvestment or divestment of resources in terms of infrastructure? Are people not getting sidewalks put down in these communities? Uh, what's the school system look, look like? And really taking a 
360 approach. And I think when you talk to people in those spaces, in those areas, I would dig into the whole, whole experience of a person um, because that's how you pull it all together. When you're having those stories with them about where they live, talk about the church, talk about the school, talk about the interaction of how this has impacted every segment of, your of their lives and you get the story out. And it, it really becomes um, the underlying issue of, of climate uh, in that space. So I, I think it's definitely one that needs to be uh, told, especially with the, the history of like the Geechee Gullah, pe Gullah people of the, of the Carolinas. There, there's, so, it, there's just so much there to, to pull from. Thank you, Heather. We have just time, I think, for maybe two, at most three more questions. I'm going to ask you to keep your responses as brief as possible. Um, first, one that is uh, obviously this session is focused on the South, but uh, we're going to have a national uh, part of this, which is President Biden, who just announced in today's press conference, by the way, that he will be announcing on Friday in Pittsburgh his new infrastructure push that has, according to early reports, a lot of uh, tie-ins with climate. He sees infrastructure spending as a way to green the economy, create jobs, et cetera. What do we expect on uh, that front in terms of the South? Have, have maybe Lindsay and, and Mark asked both, are you hearing anything from your own reporting about uh, story ideas for how reporters across the South can be covering that story? Lindsay, I'll let you go first. <laughs> I was going to tell you to go. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I, um, I think that yeah, it, there is. It, sometimes I think it's hard. I, honestly, I haven't thought about this. I feel like in the last four years, <laughs> so much because there just wasn't like national stories, except for like this. This thing is being, you know, rolled back those kinds of stories for so long. And so it's really interesting, um, just as Southerly is like growing to try to um, to get pitches that are sort of trying to figure out how to show the trickle down effects of, of Biden policies in the South. And so, um, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, really showing um, what you, the, where the federal policies feel abstract is that, you know, it, it feels like it just happens and then, and then nobody hears anything afterwards. So I'm seeing a lot of kind of, um, emails from writers across the region and also talking to advocates. I don't do much reporting myself anymore, so Mark could probably speak to this better than I can, but um, just really figuring out what, you know, what's actually going to come of the promises made um, by the administration. And, and I think that happens a lot with, um, with Democratic um, administrations and, and people in rural areas in particular in the South are really used to um, having promises made and, and not being kept. And so um, really staying on the story with that. And, um, you know, if there are jobs promised, if there are unionized jobs, if there are um, transitions in Appalachia, for instance, or the Gulf Coast, um, like Gulf South for a Green New Deal, like where, where are all these things going? And, um, and what, you know, what is being back in the Paris Climate Agreement mean? Like those sorts of um, localizing those stories to, and, and making sure that we um, speak to people on the ground about that, I think is it's just going to be really important so that um, we don't lose track of like the, the promises that are being made. And, and Mark, let me quickly toss to you there. The president did just say this afternoon uh, specifically that one of the things he wants to do is put to work a lot of the oil and other fossil fuel workers capping the oil wells. Obviously, big story in Louisiana. Yeah, so, so that would be a dramatic improvement over what's happening now. We've got several uh, tens of thousands of um, abandoned oil wells in Louisiana alone, and I know it's even more in Texas. So those are huge jobs, and they're they're oil and gas worker jobs, which is great. the The other key things that I see coming out of this um, uh, one is transportation, and uh, at some point somebody's going to have to put in the system for electrification of cars, and, and that's going to going to mean you know. Where do you pull up to get more electric gas, um, and and how do you do that, and how how do you manufacture that electricity? So that's that's going to be key. The other the other key thing that I, that I think some of the the governors are already uh, banding together about is trying to figure out how to put together some sort of network of new pipelines to deal with how to move um, uh, uh, gases. Uh, uh, carbon gases 
uh, to places where you can dispose of it, especially in in Gulf Coast areas where you 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 know the, the plans are to put it underground. So all those are financially, um, economically huge. Uh, in Louisiana, in addition to that, I, I really don't expect there will be any, but I know the state would love to have some of its coastal restoration projects, its big things going on, and some of its levies that are are not funded yet. So here again, these are big ticket items, folks, and they are going to be uh, stories that you can do in every state in the South. And I think what Mark Schlesing just said, think about talking to your governor's offices, your congressional offices. Those are the people who are in touch with the administration about these programs. And that's true of Republicans and Democrats alike, by the way. So that's one way to pursue this part of the story. That's going to be a big story going forward. Uh, there's a lot of international work showing that we have got to use this opportunity now to, as the president says, build back better. We've got to invest green as we come out of the COVID economic recession if we are going to fight off the climate emergency. And with that, I toss it back to Bernadette Woods Plackey to conclude the session. Thanks, Mark. And we're going to get you out in time. So in these last four minutes, I have a couple of things I just want to show everyone. We are going to be following up with a lot more in the way of resources. We're working on a huge document here. So a lot of good stuff to come from all that we've been discussing. And Lynn is also going to be sharing her slides, which is fantastic. But a quick snapshot before you go to just kind of get you excited about some of these resources and go right out there and do that storytelling. The National Climate Assessment, we covered it, but the Southeast region chapter is so huge. It has so much of what you're thinking about and so many story ideas in there alone. The IPCC that was covered also by Lynn. SEJ and Southerly have a Covering Your Climate the South resource of just a ton of information and ways to tell this story. There's also regional climate hubs in all of these areas. USDA, I mean, for the Southeast specifically, USDA, US Fish and Wildlife, US Forest Service, the EPA, NOAA Regional Climate Center. Your local universities are filled with really good information. Get to know the people there, converse with them. You will find out about what research is coming out before many other people do. Also, we touched on a few of these things, but the Yale Climate Opinion Maps have great information. It'll be included in your links. When you're asked things you don't know exactly how to answer, Skeptical Science has probably already gone through that. Great resource. Sideline has quick facts. I've seen those being shared in the chat function. And Climate Nexus does a roundup of climate stories that are out there every single day. It is national and global, but it can get you thinking about some ideas. Covering Climate Now, huge slew of resources. Three I'd like to highlight specifically as we prepare for a big upcoming week of reporting at Covering Climate Now. There is a guide through living through the climate emergency and a fact sheet on climate emergency, plus some basics about Climate Science 101. We at Climate Central and our Climate Matters partnership, we have this great media library. It's packed with a ton of information. You can sign up to receive the information and it comes out weekly. A whole variation of climate change topics that are often localized with data to your specific area. We also have a weather power forecasting tool that pumps out wind and solar. And I know we have some meteorologists on here too. Hey, it's weather powering our future. It's your language. We've got a sea level rise tool at Climate Central too. This thing is loaded with so much information and it has layers across the bottom from different levels of projections of social vulnerability, population, ethnicity, all what's going to be under that water as we go forward in time. Really exciting new resource from our team, Climate Reporting Masterclass. This was just launched last week. So there's a lot in here, multimedia modules, dive into various topics. We have a lot more to come on this from. This is just the beginning and wanna sum it up with this. Covering Climate Now has a really big week. You're all welcome to join a joint coverage living through the climate emergency from April 12th to this 22nd. So again, we will be following up with a lot more coming your way, but as we send you off in this last minute, again, want this to be the beginning of a conversation, not the ending of one for so many who are just joining us. And always honored to do this with my cohort, Mark here. Also happy to be joined by Southerly. Please do connect with each of our organizations. We have resources, we have newsletters, we have a lot of support, we have a lot of experience in this space and we wanna help you tell these stories. So do reach out to us and get in touch with us. And also thank you, be safe out there. It is a serious severe weather threat as I think you know, but please, please, please be careful. And we respect your time. So with that, it is time. 
and I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us today, everybody.